Hey guys, Nate here from Geek Bomb, and today we're going to be starting something new. Now, as some of you may or may not know, I'm actually a high school science and math teacher, and I thought that I'm going to use those particular skills, I guess, to our advantage. So, we're going to be starting a line of new videos where we talk about the science behind particular concepts. This month is Bay Month, not bacon and eggs, but as an attractive people. And I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to start talking about the science that is behind love and lust. I'm Nate, and welcome to Rack Your Brains. <laughs> Valentine's Day has come and gone, leaving people in a state of euphoria or in a glass cage of emotion. But is it love that is really in the air? Or is it lust that we are experiencing around this time of year? Love and lust were originally thought to be opposites of one another, with lust killing love and vice versa. However, in the last couple of decades, they have been proven to be quite synergistic with one another. They're not black and white, there is quite a bit of grey and quite a bit of overlap. The actual urge to fall in love has been proven to be quite similar to that of just hunger and looking for sex. So this overall urge to find a mate is a very primitive and biological process. They do vary however in the sense that lust can just happen, but love does take time. So before we actually go into talking about what happens inside of a person during love and lust, what about the beginning? What about that initial contact that you make with that person? Initially, when two people meet, they don't have to be of opposite sex. The brain starts analyzing them, starts critiquing them physically, because that's all it can really see. It actually starts playing a very, very ugly game of yay or nay. And we're actually very, very quick to say nay more than not. The brain doesn't play this game for very long, however, because it usually takes between 200 milliseconds and four minutes for a person to internally decide that they are attracted to someone or not. One of the initial things that your brain starts looking for is symmetry. Symmetry is a massive thing for the brain because it is a sign of good genes. Both men and women who have symmetrical faces have been shown to have a greater variety of sexual partners. Not only do we look for symmetrical faces, but we also look for people who have similar features to our own. A study performed on both a group of men and women took the images of those men and women and photoshopped them to be of the opposite sex. Those photos were then embedded in a collection of photos of people of the opposite sex and given back to those individuals. Those individuals then had to rate the people within the group. Disturbingly, not only could they not actually identify themselves who had been photoshopped to be of the opposite sex, but they also gave themselves the higher rating. <laughs> I haven't thought that far ahead. Of course not. <laughs> While we're talking about looking at someone, glances at a person of interest can actually show as to what level of infatuation you are with that person. Glances at their face suggest something maybe a little bit more, but glances at a person's body suggests a not so pure desire. Running into someone that we actually find attractive, whether it be love or lust is yet to be determined, it actually leaves us with a sense of nervousness or butterflies in our stomach. This phenomenon is basically the release of adrenaline, forcing the blood flow from your digestive system to your muscles. This is a basic instinct that we all have inside of us called fight or flight. Basically, your body is so nervous that it is getting ready to fight the threat or run away from it. Because of this, there is a sudden decrease in oxygen around the cells that are responsible for your stomach and your intestinal tract. This deficit 
is almost like pins and needles of your stomach. That's why we get that queasy, sickening feeling. When we're done with our first impressions, a cocktail of chemicals is shaken, not stirred, and then released throughout our entire system. Not only our brain, but all the rest of our organs in our body. Noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine, and dopamine are released across the brain, which make us feel happy. Not only that, but as it makes its way to our system, it increases our heart rate, making us flush and red in the face. It also, because of that, increases sweat production so that we can cool down, leaving you with very clammy hands. Studies have also identified that the chemicals that are actually flowing through your body during lust and love are quite different and identifying if it is lust or love is also a very difficult task. Studies have proven that individuals can be wrong seven times about love until they are actually married. With that in mind, however, we're now going to go past the initial contact with an individual and start talking about where it deviates into lust and love. Now, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about will cross over, not so much vice versa but they will cross over a little bit, forming some grey areas. I will try and keep strictly to lust and keep strictly to love, however. So let's move on to lust, shall we? We're going to start off with the brain, because whether you want to believe it or not, Love is thanks to the brain, not thanks to the heart. Some of the areas that are lit up in a person during the experience of lust is the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and a particular region of the striatum. The regions of the amygdala that light up are responsible for arousal. Hypothalamus are similar regions to thirst, hunger, and basic temperature control. This suggests that it is a very primal and basic instinct. Also, the striatum is lit up. Not all of it, just a particular region. And it is this region which is responsible for pure, unadulterated pleasure. The main hormones that are actually released when a person is experiencing lust or close contact to a person that they want to get jiggy with, na 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 na, their body starts to release adrenaline or epinephrine. It also starts to release testosterone. This testosterone in turn eventually releases a chemical known as nitric oxide. When these hormones are released, it makes you focus a lot more. Focus your attention on the person that you have these lustful desires for, which can make it very hard to sleep at times. During arousal, this testosterone is released. This results in the release of nitric oxide, and it is this chemical within men that makes them I'm not going to explain that one, but it makes it very awkward depending on when, where, and also who. Actually going out and satisfying these cravings is a very vicious cycle. Once satisfaction has occurred, there is an increase in the release of testosterone on top of the testosterone that is already in your system, making you want it more. This does have some slightly negative effects, if you will. Men with an increased or elevated level of testosterone have an ability to suppress oxytocin and vasopressin. These chemicals are very important for attachment love. This suggests that individuals with a higher level of testosterone might have trouble maintaining a relationship. It's not all bad, there are some benefits of sex as well. One of them is sex results in the vasodilation of your circulatory system. This means that all of your arteries and your veins open up a little bit more. This decreases blood pressure and also associated tension. This suggests that having sex can actually get rid of a headache or a migraine. So there you are boys and girls, you've got a new code word. During sex, I kind of feel like there is going to be quite a lot of kissing involved. And as horrid as this sounds, kissing someone is very similar to smelling or tasting someone. Kissing is actually very, very important. It allows for saliva to mix. It also allows for the exchange of chemical markers between the person. This actually tells a lot about that person. It tells us a little bit about their immune system and also if we are compatible with them on a slightly chemical level. And I'm really, really sorry girls, but this is the reason why men love to play that game called tonsil hockey. Men do it subconsciously because men's senses, not only taste but a lot of their other senses, aren't as sharp as women. So to be able to adequately scope out their potential partner, they go a little bit deeper. Not only are these chemical markers in our saliva, but they are also in our sweat. 
So, historically, sweat was actually put into perfumes and potions. I guess that's the secret behind the Harry Potter love potion. I think I love her. Well, brilliant. Do you think she knows I exist? So that's a basic rundown of some of the exclusive things that happen in a person's brain and body when they are experiencing lust. But what about love? It gets a lot more crazy. So in love, the brain actually lights up all over the place. Most of them are dopamine sensitive regions. It is this region of the brain which is responsible for cravings, euphoria and also addiction. One of these areas of the brain is another region of the striatum, similar to that with lust. However, this region gives meaning to pleasure and not just pure pleasure on its own. So, a serious love attraction or a case of the feels releases dopamine and serotonin. This causes happiness, exhilaration and also a loss in appetite. Feelings of attachment for another person also releases another hormone called oxytocin. This has been described as the love or the bonding hormone. You know all that really icky stuff your parents used to do in public like holding hands and kissing? Yeah, it's released in those acts as well and it makes the bond even stronger. So when in love your brain is flooded with dopamine. This is a serious case of the feels, but it also forces the brain to release more dopamine. And it is this relay which is similar to when you take cocaine. Love actually does some really weird things to your body as well. It's actually kind of romantic. When you're looking into the eyes of the person that you love for an extended period of time, your pupils dilate. This dilation of the pupils makes you more attractive to the person you're looking at. So you're more attractive to each other because you're looking at each other. Not only that, but couples who are looking at each other wearing a heart rate monitor, it was actually identified that their heart rates fell in sync. Romantic love and the flurry of chemicals that is released because of it is an incredibly tiring and stressful thing on the body. Studies show that this stage only lasts for an average of just over a year. It is at this point that that romantic love becomes attachment love and a long term relationship develops from there. Experts say, however, that if you want to extend the life of your romantic love, that you participate in activities as a couple that are both exciting and satisfying. He's my brother. So, that's it for the specifications of love and lust. Now, I do realise that the list for love seems a lot shorter than what actually happens to a person during lust. The thing is, however, a lot of the things that happen in lust cross over into love quite a bit, but not vice versa. It is this which makes love an incredibly complicated but also an amazing thing. So, that's my incredibly basic rundown of love and lust. I'm Nate, and I hope I've racked your brains. Crush on Knight Captain Commander Cullen, who is one of your advisors that you play with in the game. Actually, I would say we more than have a crush. We're actually totally obsessed. His sex scene is pretty hot, and I've recorded my reaction. Get ready to cringe. <laughs> Straight into a cutscene, this is good, this is good.